for a few minutes after one, we will go ahead and begin. And I just want to um, start by welcoming everyone. I'm Kelsey Wiskirkin. I am WARP's executive director. And um, I'm going to just do a quick screen share of the WARP webpage just for anyone who is, is new to WARP or new to our programs. I'd like to just share um, where you can find more information about WARP and and just share a bit about us very briefly. Um, so this is the WARP website. You can find us at weavarealpeace.org. Um, the homepage here has an events tab where you can find other upcoming events. We have this panel today is part of a series of monthly um, programs called Continuing Textile Traditions. So you can view upcoming events and register for them on our website. We and welcome you can also guests and view members. Recordings of all of our previous programs here under previous events. Uh, Warp is a, a member networking organization with the mission of improving the quality of life of textile artisans worldwide. And so if you're interested in learning more <laughs> about Warp or joining the organization, you, there's a membership tab here on the website. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to share that WARP is going to be giving a series of uh, COVID relief artisan textile grants this year. This is a program we started last year. Uh, we gave 12 grants to weaving communities in different parts of the world. And we have a commitment to continue that program again this year. And we are currently um, fundraising with the goal of giving $10,000 worth of grants. Um, so we have, uh, uh, matching fundraiser going on right now. Um, the Ellen Merritt Bequest Fund will be matching all grants um, up to $5,000 from now until March 15th. So if you're interested in um, donating to help us with the Artisan Grant Program, you can find the donate button right here on our website. So um, thank you for uh, joining us. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to introduce the panel and introduce our first speaker. So welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, this program, our panel discussion today is called A Sheep's Tale, Preserving the Churro. And this presentation is about the importance of the Navajo churro sheep and the work that has been done to revive this breed, which was in danger of extinction in the 1970s. And we have three wonderful speakers today who have been working together actually for decades to ensure the survival of the Navajo churro. Um, so I would like to thank Molly Manzanares, Dr. Alta Pachowski Begay, and Dr. Lyle McNeil for joining us for this panel. Um, our first speaker will be Molly, and I'll give a, a brief introduction, and then Molly will be sharing her presentation. Um, so Molly Manzanares is a native New Mexican with a lifelong involvement in agriculture. And she and her husband, Antonio, raise both churro and rambulette sheep and sell yarn weavings and other sheep products through their companies, Tierra Wools and Shepherd's Lamb. And Molly and Antonio run one of the last remaining herded bands of sheep in the state of New Mexico. So Molly, welcome to you. And I'll turn it over to you to share your presentation. Thank you, Kelsey. Let me share my screen. Are you able to see the map? Yes, that looks great. All right. Yes, thanks for having us. And um, I'll just begin. I'm Molly Monsonares, as Kelsey said. And my husband and I live in Ramaria, New Mexico. And it's in the north central part of the state, a little northwest. We're about 70 miles or 80 miles from Farmington on the east eastern edge of the Diné Nation or Navajo Nation. And we're about 160 miles north. And we live in the and they'll add other colors to this, but these colors my um Presentation is not okay there. We live in the Chama River Valley. This is about um, not even a mile from home. And we're at about 7,200 feet elevation. And this is my husband Antonio and myself. We've 
uh, been married since 1979 and we have four kids who are all grown and gone, but they were all um, involved in the ranch. They helped us out for many years and now we're all by ourselves. <clears throat> this is a picture on our home place in the spring. The lambs are small there. We run between 600 and 800 mother ewes and I give you that spread because it, one of the hardest things in raising sheep is actually keeping the numbers up because thing you know you have to call ewes when they get older and um, the numbers just drop and you just have to keep either breeding re replacement stock or buying and um, I'm just going to show you a few slides of more more pictures of the valley so this is this is actually fall up on the mountain and this is Javier he's our shepherd right now we've had different shepherds over the year Javier's been with us for about eight years now and uh, my husband's always says that he's our banker because he has our he has everything that we'll make for the year and for from now on right in front of him all, all year long this is a a uh, close-up of the of the herd and um, we have a mixed flock. So right in the center you can see a, a, a little churro you and then we have rambole. So there's rambolets and and some churro. And we have about 325 churros right now and about 350 rambolets. And this is a picture from the early years. We started, um, my husband and I were both involved in starting Ganados del Valle, which was, um, it became an economic, agricultural economic development um, nonprofit. It was always a nonprofit. And um, in the early years, we just got together and tried to figure out ways that we could bring in income to the to the valley and looked at natural resources that we had available. And we had a small flock of sheep that my husband had uh, before we even married, he had about 90. And then we got married and we just started, we actually started with cattle and it didn't work out too well for us. Mm -hmm. But I grew up in a cattle ranching family and I married a sheepman. So we started raising um, sheep. And then when we started with Ganados del Valle, we, um, Dr. McNeil came to the valley and identified traits in uh, the Navajo Churro within some of the flocks that were in the valley. The valley is mostly uh, Hispanic and people had been there for a long time and there were sheep there that had um, had traits of the Navajo Churro, but they, it, they had been bred to Rambole and other things. So he helped us get rams. We got rams and started breeding back. We had a, a churro breeding program. Mm -hmm. This is an early ram. His name was Benjamin. He was kind of famous or infamous, however you want to look at it. But um, <laughs> we, uh, mm -hmm. let's see what else. We, we formed that and then uh, that organization. And then Chero Wools was actually born from the wool committee of the nonprofit. And we started out in Los Ojos in, a, in an old mercantile building, a large mercantile building. And we've since moved from there. But here we have some of our current day, we have, there's three churros there. And um, I have to say that I love the churro sheep. They are a little wilder. They're not as domesticated as the Rambouillet, but I enjoy them very much. They're, uh, they take really good care of themselves. They are fertile. They produce um, a lot of twins, not all twins, but quite a few twins and sometimes triplets. And, but they really take care of their lambs. And the, when the lambs are born, they're very hardy. They are up and running around really quickly in comparison to the Rambouillet. And um, they'll jump up and run after their mothers really soon. Mm -hmm. The wool is great for hand spinning, great for hand weaving. It's long and, you know, if you have good churro, it's lustrous. And it comes in a variety of 
natural undyed colors. So you can see there's a black and a, and a grayish and a brown right there. And we also breed white because we do some natural, some dyeing. So it has low grease content and it takes dye very well. And it makes a strong and durable yarn. And here's a little ewe lamb walking down the highway. And here's a close up of a, of a churro ewe. Some of these I'm gonna go, I have a lot of slides, so I'm gonna go quick, kind of quickly through. And here's a little group of churros coming to the feed wagon in the, in the winter time. And right now I'm gonna kind of go through the seasons, uh, how, the, what, how the seasons go on the sheep ranch. And this is lambing time. Lambing time is very intense for us. It's, um, end of end of April and into May, and um, we're horse. I'm horseback every day. I love uh, lambing; it's my favorite time of the year. And but we hire a little more of a crew for lambing time, and we lamb. We range lamb basically, but which means that we're not lambing in a barn, but we um, we also manage the sheep very closely. So. We move them twice a day and then we handle any problems that come up. So we're sort of, we're, we're hands off and then we're hands on. And we, we usually get a pretty good uh, lamb crop. This is a, a photo of the corral during lambing. And the, the pins you can see on both sides of the corral, we call them jails. And sometimes there will be a problem where a ewe doesn't take a lamb or a ewe loses a lamb and, and another ewe has lambed. Uh, and had problems and so we'll graft a uh, lamb onto the one who lost her lamb. So we do a lot of things in these pens and, but the ewe and the lamb usually stay in there from, from a morning to maybe up to three days or so. And then they go back with the band when, when, when we're either successful in grafting a lamb or, or not, we make a decision and so, and then sometimes we'll end up with a with a penko, we call them penkos, which are doggy lambs. And this young man is feeding a penko there. And then after lambing, uh, after all the lambs are on the ground, it's, it's the, toward the end of May and it's time for docking. So we get the sheep in and we sort all the lambs and there's all the lambs in the pen and we're getting ready to dock them. It's called docking or marking. And here's the crew docking. We castrate the lambs, uh, they short, we shorten their tails and um, earmark them. And then it's time uh, after that, about the 10th of May, it's time to take, of June, it's a time to go to the summer range, which is in the Carson National Forest near Conjilon, New Mexico. It's probably, as the crow flies, maybe 30, my, 30 miles from home. And we used to, we used to, um, trail the whole band to all the way to the mountain from home to the mountain and we've gotten old and tired and so we actually truck them to the mountain and here we are on the mountain and getting ready to go to the first campsite and here's the camp uh, that Javier stays at he, he stays on the mountain from the time we take the sheep up till the time we bring them down and he stays with two horses and and a working dog and several guard dogs. And I don't know if you can see the guard dog on the right side of the screen. Here's just a, a photo of grazing on the mountain. And here's a guard dog up close. We've had several different kinds of dog, guard dogs over the years. Um, some last many years and some don't last very long. Different things happen to them, but We've had Great Pyrenees, Anatolian Shepherds, Commodores, and Marimas, and they do a really good job. And in the meantime, while we're up on the mountain with the sheep, we're at home irrigating and getting ready for haying time to get ready for winter. And then here, we're getting ready to go on the trail. It really doesn't take this many people, but it's because it's kind of a family time. We get together, the kids come home and uh, even our grandchildren have started to come. And this is the early morning when we're preparing to go on the trail. 
and we go across the mountain one day. We used to take three days to get home, but now we the, see the lambs are bigger now, so it's they can travel a lot better. So we go across the mountain. It was a long, long day across the mountain, and then the and then uh, the second day is a shorter day. But we miss it's no better. It's no better. I'm getting some feedback here. Here we we're going down the highway. It's about uh, 15 miles to home. And we're hit, here. We're coming into Tierra Maria and and um, going past the high, uh, the high school is up on the hill. We go past there and then go home. And then once we're home, the next day we start working the sheep in the corrals, wean the lambs, um, sort the ewes, uh, bag them, meaning we check their udders and we check their teeth and see if they can make it another year or if they have to be culled. And um let's see i guess that's about what we do right then and then the next thing is around the first of december it's time for breeding this is a, a churro ram and when it's time for breeding we sort the ewes into uh, different breeds and put them in different pastures and then we sort the churros as much as we have room for, we sort them according to color so we can uh, keep color lines going. And then um, this is just a photo because we're winter feeding starts usually late November and we feed all winter every day. Every day we're feeding. This is the, um, this is after everybody's all uh, mixed back together because you can see a little ram in there. And this, but this is a picture of the churros all sorted out. So after um, around uh, April 1st, around the first week of April, during the first two weeks of April, it all depends on the weather, it's time for shearing. And we are lucky enough to have a shearing crew still up in the San Luis Valley, which is maybe an hour and a half from where we live. And so they still come and shear the sheep. They bring their own shearing trailer which is really nice. It's a trailer home that has been gutted and, and they've converted it into a shearing trailer. And as you can see, the sheep come up in through this alley and then there's doors and each, each shearer is in front of a door that has a spring. And they, pull, they open the door and pull the sheep out and shear the sheep. Keeps the wool a lot cleaner. And then the sheep on the opposite side go out the door when after they're shorn and the wool gets kicked out of a hole. And you'll see that along the side of the trailer, the, the wool comes out of there and then we grab the fleeces and we're skirting. We, we, every fleece goes across the skirting table. The table that's there is called the skirting table. And we take off all the undesirable parts and then we sort the wool into different lots and we, then we bail it up. We're also fortunate these days that we have the shearer brings a, a baler, a wool baler, and the, the bales you see on the trailer are very handy for storing and for, um, and for transporting the wool. It makes it a lot easier. Each of those bales weighs between four and 500 pounds. And then after shearing, it's lambing time again. And so here's just a picture of a couple of churro ewes that are a bit, they're shorn. And we shear before lambing because it helps uh, during lambing that the ewes will have a better tendency to go find shelter and take better care of the lambs. And it's just all the way around, it's easier. The lambs have a easier time finding the udder and we just like to shear before we lamb. And there's a brand new Rambolet lamb. And now I'll give you just a quick overview of the products that we get. And once the wool is off, we haul it up to right now. We've done different things over the years. It's hard to fit 40 years into 10 minutes, but we take the, the wool up to a Mountain Meadow Wool Mill in Wyoming and have it spun into yarn. 
So here's a dark gray, a medium gray, and a light gray shooter yarn. And we do two weights. We do a rug weight that's um, about 400 yards per pound, 450. And the blanket weight is finer. It's about 950 yards per pound. And we do different products, make different hand woven products from that yarn. And we sell that yarn. And um, these are some natural dyes. My sister, Tony, does the natural dyeing. And she's uh, been doing it for about, I guess about six, seven years. And she's, she's a chemist, I guess. She um, loves mixing and over dyeing and she gets wonderful colors. We gather as much as we can from around home. We get chamisa, yerba de, de la negrita, acorns and uh, juniper. And, but most of those things give yellows and greens. And so we also purchase indigo, matter, and cochineal. So we get indigos, the blues, um, matters, the orange, and cochineal for the reds. So here's a picture of a dye setup. And here's some of the colors that she gets, we get from the, from the natural dyes. And in the meantime, we're also dyeing with commercial dyes, acid dyes. So with a little bit of sulfuric acid, we, we uh, Sophia is dyeing here. Sophia has been with us since, we've been working together since uh, 1986. And her son, Nathaniel, is the same age as our son. And he's working with us now. He's actually, this year, has become the general manager of the shop, which is wonderful. Giving me more time to weave and do other things. Um, with the commercial dyes, we can dye more poundage, and it takes it doesn't take much water. It's pretty efficient process, but we get some really great colors from the. And these these are actually color from the yarn line. These are from the yarn line, and when I say yarn line, with the commercial dyes, you're able to reproduce. The dye lots may be different, but at least we can do the same colors over and over so that we, we're able to have these online. We um, sell them through our store and also have an online. So these next four or five slides are the process from the yarn through the weaving. So our daughter took this these yarns and she has a little sketch there. And then she's weaving a weaving with those colors. And then here's the finished weaving. She's cut, partially cut it off of the loom. And then here's the weaving. And what we use to weave is the Rio Grande style loom. Uh, it's a traditional floor loom, counterbalance loom. We can get really good tension with that loom. So we have different sizes of those looms in our shop. And here's just a few uh, photos of some weavings that I've done in the past. And the one on the right is with all natural colors. So I got from black to brown and gray and white. It's churro is just the best. And this is a, just to indicate we give classes. So we give classes from April through October and then the the last the first three months out of the year, we take some time, we close the shop so that we can weave ourselves. And um, this is our, we moved from the retail store in Los Ojos and now we're south of Chama, New Mexico. Um, this is a picture of, it's in the Bosque just south of the bridge in Chama. And it's smaller building than we were in, but we, we fit, we managed to fit it. And this is the inside where we have several different, quite a few different products and quite a bit of yarn and a little bit of the equipment. And on the left side of this photo, you can see into the classroom. We have four looms in there and we keep our classes small so that there's only usually four, four to six students so that we everybody gets a lot of attention. And there's the yarn line, uh, churro um, rug and blanket weight on the wall. 
And just an aside, what we do with the rambling wool is we skirt it, we pack it up, we send it to San Angelo to have it scoured. And then we've sent it to Massachusetts and get, had uh, bedding, wool blankets made. And then, and then while that's going on, you won't see in very many pictures of Antonio and me together. And I get, maybe you can tell why, but on Saturdays, he's headed to the market. And he, uh, is, he, he takes the, we, when the, the lambs are weaned in the fall, we take them to the sunny side meets in in Sunnyside, Colorado, just south of Durango, and they pasture around the Sunnyside plant. And it's organic pasture. And then we, Antonio goes over every, every two weeks and sorts off lambs to go, 50 or 60 lambs to be slaughtered. So we actually, um, then he he goes every week because he goes and sorts and and the, the lambs are harvested. And then the next week he goes and picks up meat. And then every Saturday he goes to Santa Fe and sells meat at the Santa Fe farmer's market. And sometimes takes blankets and sometimes yarn and always pelts. So we have the churro pelts and also uh, pelts from the Rambouillet. And that's what we do. So that's about the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Molly. Thank you for sharing these wonderful, beautiful images with us. Um, there are a few questions coming in for you in the chat, but I think we'll save them for the end. Um, but one person did mention that you have a documentary on YouTube that's wonderful too. So if you have the link for that, please share that in the chat. Um, and uh, just to let everyone know, we'll send a follow-up email uh, next week with the recording to the program today and also the contact information that's on the final slides for each presenter so that you um, can reach out and connect individually. Um, okay, so next uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Alta pachowski Begay. Uh, Alta is the president of the Hojo Center Board of Directors. And one of the initiatives of the Hojo Center is to be the permanent home for the Navajo churro sheep. And Alta has worked in the mental health field in the Navajo Nation for over 30 years. And she foresees the Hojo Center as a place for healing and sustaining future generations. So Alta, welcome. And um, Alta has asked me to share a video from the Hojo Center first before she begins to talk. So I am going to share my screen and play this just brief video that gives an overview uh, of the work of the Hojo Center. Hojon
Okay, Alta, welcome to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, and good morning, everybody. And I want to thank um, our sponsors today for um, bringing us to the space here. Um, weave in real peace. I thought that was a beautiful name. So here this morning, and um, I don't know if um, you got my um, presentation there or. I do or have it, and I'll, I'll begin it. Um, okay. Here. So um, we'll start here uh, with a, a picture. And so I'm, El, I'm Elta, and my, my clans are Nashtajakapaha, which is Zuni Edgewater. Um, I'm at the, uh, my father is Dominico Zasana, and my pater paternal grandfathers are Sandra Kinnan, and my maternal paternal grandfathers are the Honeycomb, um, I mean, the Tiring House, the Kia'ani. And I'm originally from Jedito, Arizona, and that's where I come from. So you see on the uh, left over there a picture. Um, of my grandma, my my granddaughter, Aubrey. So my story is telling a story of my family here. So all, all all tapestries are made from stories, and so I want to entitle my my presentation a uh, um, the weaving of a prayer today. And it's good that we start off with Molly. Um, today and uh, the incredible work that's being done with Tierra Wolves because that's the some of the end things or the the, the, the where we want to be in, in years from here. So with the Hojo, and I'm calling it the Hojo Voices of Healing Center. That's the, the name of it. And why I start with my granddaughter here is there's a story, you know, the pandemic. Uh, we have a history of trauma. And during the pandemic, this little girl was born. And uh, she was born, um, got very ill. And I think that we believe that, you know, the pandemic had um, touched the children before, before we even knew the pandemic was everywhere else. So she started out her life that way, you know, and now she's two years old. And um, and I, I intentionally left my shirt dirty because she she blessed me with all her her um her uh her her, her germs and everything. So I was holding her and I was like, that's a beautiful um, picture. So the metal one is my rug that I wove during the pandemic. So that's that's that picture. So we can move forward and some tell you a story about my family. So um, what I want you to do for now is um, all of you, let's get recentered because this is the, the place and because of the psychology and the counselor in me says, okay, let's close our eyes. Let's recenter. Let's bring that breath to us. Take a deep breath and exhale. Think about all the, the energies that's here from the, from the earth from the air, from the water, from the mother earth, from all these animals, plants, that environment. So let's breathe all that into ourselves. Take in some deep breaths in. And when you exhale, think about expelling all these toxins that we have in our body that we carry. Because this is where the trauma, we talk about trauma. Trauma is things that happen to us, the events that happen that impact our life and that keep us unhealthy. So we want to expel all those toxins like that. So while you're breathing, I'm gonna read this to you. Sometimes when I close my eyes, I can remember the sounds of sheep breath bleating, horses neighing, fires crackling, and children's laughing. I can almost hear the sound of the men repairing fences or the sounds of their silver being smithed. The sound of the Shamasana grandmother pounding on her baton on the weaving loom 
against the sturdy, beautiful wool. Sometimes when I am very still, I can almost hear some sounds I hear as a child growing up on the Edgewater sheep camp. So here it says dreaming a weaving, dream weaving on the Mother Earth. And this was me somewhere and I found this picture. So I thought it was it would be a, a good starter here as we breathe and take in the air and um, acknowledge each other for being here. All the participants, thank you for being here today. Without you, we wouldn't have presentations. So go ahead and move to the next slide, please. So I'm telling the story starts here. Um, so in the Diné culture, um, we have lots of traumas, okay? So historical trauma is a big one. And back in the 1800s, in the, we had what we call the long walk and other traumas in our lives, you know? So here's my grandmother and her name was Akhadi Ba, my grandmother. And she was born at the tail end of the long walk in the 18, which was in the 1863, 68. And my, my grandmother was married to my grandfather, who was a medicine person. So I come from a long line of medicine people also. So the story begins, you know, we look back ancestry-wise. Who's behind us? How do we weave our story forward? And my, my story is about healing. It's about having a, a positive outlook on life. And that's woven into the Diné philosophy of, of hope and balance and, and new beginnings and relationships. So my grandmother was a big woman and she lived back in that time of, of the 1800s and to the 1900s and she died when she was 105. So go ahead and go to the next slide. And this is my father, a skinny gold tooth, um, a skinny cuddly day. He used to call him. He was called the cowboy man. And, and, our, and he lived to be 106 years old. So there's longevity in my family. And, and, yeah. he's the, and he's the reason why this story is happening with the churls. So um, in 2011, he was presented with the first to be the first indigenous um, honored by the farmer farming and ranching um, of Arizona. And in 1983, he met Dr. McNeil. We were at the University of Minnesota for whatever reason, my family was invited to do a weaving show. And my father was walking around the museum and came, happened upon Lyle's presentation. So my father said, Come with me, daughters. He was all excited. He said, I want to know what this man's talking about because I see the sheep that I used to know. I used to hurt. And I want those to come back to our people. So that's where the story begins of the Edgewater. Go ahead and move forward, please. Okay, and this is my mother. And she's, both my parents are gone, but she was the matriarch of our family. And that's her rug there that she said, she's, she wove, she said, we, some of these yei, the holy people rugs. And she was the matriarch. She was the herbalist. She was the medicine woman in our family. So go ahead and move forward. So I'm telling the story real quickly here because um, we're, we're supposed to just have a time limit, but. We're, we're very bad about time limits. So the story <laughs> begins with um, in 1990, um, this is my life um, story. In 1990, we established what we call the, the Nebi'ina, which is, um, you see the Hogan and the sheep there. And this was the spinoff again from the Navajo Sheep Project. So this is the Navajo Sheep Project on the Navajo Nation. So we call it the Nebi'ina, and it, it's been in existence, and it still exists today. 
but it started with a, a, the idea that how do we bring these sheep here? And there was like three or four families we started getting together and we formed this organization. So and, and still you can look it up um, today, but that's what DBI we call it. So go ahead and move forward. So that's one of the big stories that, that happened. And then you saw my father, okay? And here's a grandson of Goldtooth, Shauna Dean Pachowski Bigi. He's a auto tech instructor at the Navajo Technical University. And he's also a founder of the Berego Pass, which will be the home of the Voices of Healing Ojo Center. So he, it's, it's 20 years from the, the death of my dad to this time that this young man found this land that we're, we're in the process of um, purchasing. Go ahead and move forward. And now we're at this place called, um, this is our, um, our logo, which was designed by um, my, my brother, David K. John, who lives in Kianta, Arizona. And again, um, the significance of the logo, we thought about how do we um, develop this. So it's the four worlds of the Bethne, and at the top you see the churros, and the male and the female hogan, um, the, the male and female uh, in the middle, you see you know, how we came from the earth and we're, we're at the, the top now and those worlds there. So he was trying to capture that. So. That's what our emblem and our logo is about. Go ahead and move forward. So I'm talking really quick here because I feel like we're getting behind time here. So this is our website and you can visit the, the website. Go ahead and move forward. And this is a aerial picture of the, um, it's, this is Crown Point area. So this is where the we're looking at the Hojo Center being the, the home of, of the many things that will happen. Go ahead and move forward. And this is my family. And the reason that um, I put this here is um, the work eh, building and maintaining positive relationship. So as we dream into this, dream this center into um, fruition, these are the, the tenets, the Navajo philosophy, and one of the, the big ones is ke. So we want to have ke. And this is a picture maybe way back in the 80s that um, I put in here of my family in right in front of my mom and, and dad's hogan. And you see the generational um, members there. Go ahead and move forward. And again, you know, there's different ideas. And one of the ideas is, you know, to have this permanent place for the sheep, the churros, because as the Nay people, they were a great part of our life. That's what sustained us. That's what um, was our economy before it was um, decimated by, by um, others who felt that it wasn't necessary and took us from being a sustainable community to a dependent community on um, the outside to provide us. So we want to go back to that space of, of healing so that we can be sustainable again. Go ahead and move forward. And revitalizing the arts. This is my sister and her, she's a weaver, she's a spinner, she's a, the everything of our family. So revitalizing art will be part of the center. Go ahead and move forward. And the big component as I'm talking right now is the healing because of the Nay people, you know, with that's what sustain us also is our healing ceremonies and maintaining traditions. And here, this is my daughter when she was doing her kinalpa. The, the puberty ceremony and you see the people there. So go ahead and move forward. Emerging leaders, we want to have um, our young people be a, be a part of this community that we're developing. And that again, go ahead, move forward. 
And then we want to remain remain having having um, uh, a, a focus on maintaining and also fostering knowledge from the elders and also from the young people, you know, so that having that intergenerational um, relationships. But next. And teaching youth about sustaining, sustaining ourselves and having that sustainable living. So here's my daughter when during the Kinolda, her puberty, and she's helping to carry a, a little um, kid, I think, to the corral. And when, when the puberty ceremonies are going on and the young woman is um, asked to do lots of different work so that she can learn learn about being becoming a woman. So whatever she's asked to do, she has to do. So this is what uh, my daughter was doing at that time. Next. And then weaving intergenerational connections and healing. And you see the flock that we used to have at that time. And there's my, um, my dad and my my nephew Leland looking at the sheep, um, probably having a conversation about something. So go ahead and um, move forward, please. And this is the prayer um, that this within my prayer, what I just said, I showed you the family and the weaving of that prayer and how we uh, move forward. So. My story is about um, having a piece of ground that we can, we're going to do healing on. And that ground, I believe, you know, is, is going to encompass not just the churro sheep, but it's going to encompass a healing center. And as I talk about trauma, as I talk about historical trauma, emotional trauma, that this is going to be a healing place for all peoples and all uh, that come there. And so this is the dream. We're dreaming into a space of um, that there's gonna be other, we have lots of connect, we're connecting with, with people as we go along, you know, as, as you establish an organization or project, there's lots of moving parts to it. There's uh, many people that, that you, invite that you have conversations with. So I hope that this is a space for those continued conversations and a place of relaxation, a place of healing. So we have um, organizations that we've been working with um, along the way here, just as we had established the Dinebi'i, not DBI, where the voices of, the Dahoja Voices of Healing is also involved with um, picking up and introducing ourselves and having relations with peoples that are in the field of um, sustainable living already. So the pieces that I wanna add to this is the healing part of it. So I want to have the healing of working with your hands, the healing of um, hearing voices, the healing of songs, the healing of art, the healing of of all these components that, that we need to, to sustain ourselves and move us forward into life in, in a happy way and, and, and be thankful even though we've been through a pandemic, those negative things bring us positive and bring us through um, good things to dream, good things to, to move forward with. So I'm, I'm thankful that I could be um, here to talk about a little piece of the journey that I'm doing here. So now my time is telling me that I, I spent all of it. That, so I will, yeah. So um, I'll, I'll say my prayer for you because that's part of my, my um, uh, how I want to end this presentation for you. 
So it's a jet for John Rolly, she care for John Rolly, come. She care for John Rolly, she agi for John. Ah, as for Shinare, for John Rolly, come. For John Asli, for John Asli, for John Asli, for John Asli. Thank you. Thank you, Alta. Thank you for sharing this with us. Um, I just want to say that uh, if anyone would like to put questions into the chat, we have no problem with the kids, so I don't know. We're going to continue with uh, Dr. McNeil's presentation. Um, we we usually have about an hour long program, and today it will run longer. So we we welcome you to stay. Um, you know, for the full length, but if you if you are unable to stay, then we will be sharing the recording in the next few days. So um, I, I'm so glad Alta, that you used your full time because I wouldn't have wanted us to miss any of that. Um, so, okay, next, next up, up is Dr. Lyle McNeil, McNeil um, known as Doc. And Doc is an Emeritus Professor of Animal, Dairy and Veterinary Sciences at Utah State University and is the founder of the Navajo Sheep Project. In 2019, he retired from USU after 40 years of service in teaching, research, and extension outreach education for youth and livestock ranchers. And Doc will be sharing about the pioneering work done by the Navajo Sheep Project to ensure the survival of the Navajo Churro sheep. So Doc, welcome to you. Uh, thank you, Kelsey. I appreciate that. It's hard to follow two great people like Molly and Elta. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And uh, they're both great weavers too. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I'm just an old sheep herder. <laughs> but uh, you got my PowerPoint there? I'm sharing it right now. We'll get your first slide geared up and uh, let's see here. I also want to thank uh, the contributions uh, that you've done uh, for helping us to uh, Kelsey and your organization share the words of Molly and, and Antonio and Elta and, and uh, the, the work on the Hojo Center that's coming along. It's been a long time dream. We've all had. So uh, I'm getting a little fuzzy at this end. Are you getting a slide okay? I can hear you okay, Doc. And um, your PowerPoint is now up on the screen. Are you able to see it on your end? Yeah, it's kind of kind of fuzzy though. I mean, there you go. There you go. Okay, great. Um, well. This all started uh, with me with these Navajo churro sheep that we call them now. And uh, I got somehow involved in being the person to initiate their rescue from extinction. Uh, next slide. Uh, one thing I learned early on, and this is back in 1972, when I learned that they were almost extinct and they were down to about 435 head by an accurate census uh, of the tribal veterinarians. But you can see the fleece there. It's one of our samples. Shows you it has a long outer coat and a dense undercoat. And this makes it very unique for hand processing and weaving as Molly and Elta have told you and shown you too. But it's a fleece type, very uncommon in the United States. And this was actually the first sheep to North America that was a domestic sheep. And uh, Hispanic cultures brought that to this region of the Southwest. And uh, glad we still got it. 
Next slide. And this just picture shows the fiber types on the fleece, which are very unique. Uh, and you won't find them like on Molly's Rambouillet she was talking about. They, they're fine, very fine wool and very important in our national industry uh, for you know, machine processing. And they can be hand processed too. But uh, the churro is undesirable for machine looms uh, and the big mills that we used to have here at that time in the United States. Um, but the variety of fibers, there's a certain percentage of them that are very important in the churro. And one of uh, our friends uh, down on the Rama Navajo Reservation there, Nellie Pino, uh, she's showing her Yebiche rug she made with uh, churro fleece. A very good weaver. Next slide. With regards to weaving history on the, the Navajo land, which was called Denata, and not a reservation that was made later by the government, but in the early weavings, these were some of the first wearing blankets, and these aren't rugs. They're, they're a wearing blanket, and they called them chief's blankets. And they started on the left there with the first phase, which was mainly uh, a white wool and, and indigo dyed, and some were black too, and simple stripes. And then they just went over and evolved into a third phase, which is more complicated. And Molly showed you pictures of their uh, Hispanic loom, which is a horizontal loom. Uh, and the Navajos used a vertical loom, which many of you have seen, I'm sure, that has contact with Mother Earth and reaches up to Father Sky. So this that loom too is very, very sacred. But Navajos today also use other looms, but traditional weavers use the traditional looms, the vertical loom. Next. Next slide. And these are just pictures of some over in New Mexico, particularly with the Hispanic textiles and also indigenous people there like the Chamayo. Uh, weaving was unique to its own culture as was the Saltillo Serape one on the right there. And personally, I like both types of weaving and uh, they're, they're beautiful. And these again can be wearable and uh, practical for wraps, keep you warm, but also today for hanging on the wall or putting on the floor or furniture, whatever. Next. Uh, <clears throat> Alta mentioned the long walk and that was of course led by Colonel Carson, Kit Carson. After that in the thirties, because the Navajos had too many of these churro sheep, the government initiated a program that I call a holocaust of these sheep. But it was called the stock reduction, it ran from 1934 up till 1948. And uh, it was hidden from most of the culture in America, the Anglo culture. But it was, it was terrible. And this is a way 
that the government want to initiate the Navajos raising Rambouillets and Merino fine wool sheep and not these churro sheep that were not valuable to the Anglo machine processed woolen products. And the guy in charge was Indian Commissioner John Collier. And in the early years of the project, I remember many Navajo matriarchs, the ladies, elders telling me about damn John Collier. That's how they referred to him. They were, he was not a good person, that's for sure. His assistant that conducted most of the work on the reservation was Ed Fryer. And you can see a picture on the right there. Many of the families, in order to get rid of them, they just told them to bring their sheep flocks to these box canyons nearby. And these government agents would shoot them and just leave the carcasses to rot. And on many presentations where I have more time, I actually show pictures of the bones and skeletons I saw in my early years working on the res to find these sheep where these were just piled of bones. This was not good. And the churro, of course, and then goats were the primary targets. Next slide. By the way, Ed Fryer tried to stop me from doing what I was doing with the Navajo sheep project too. So I decided after finding out all I did in the early 70s, I thought I was gonna in 1977, start looking for these sheep. And uh, this is this young guy down here this, who's now <laughs> pretty old. <laughs> but when I was starting to look for these sheep, and this was down around Anath, Utah, which is the reservation covers parts of Utah, a large part of New Mexico, and a large part of Arizona. In fact, the Navajo Nation's about the size of West Virginia. Next slide. And then we asked Navajo students at the university to kind of design a logo for us. And this is the one that was, came up. We didn't do it. It was designed by our artistic Navajo students there at Utah State. Uh, it's like a wedding basket with a, a four horn buck in the pick in the center. So, and our motto of course is serving the people, preserving cultures. And that's why we fit so well into what Alta was talking about with regards to the, the Hojo Center at Borrego Pass. Next slide. So we had, a, we set up a mission and early on, I didn't have a lot of people helping, but thank goodness for my Navajo students and some other students that could speak the language. As back in those days on the res, reservation, not much English was spoken. But our mission with the project was to rescue the remaining churros that we could find from extinction or consumption or death by age. And like I said earlier, 435 were around. And I spent lots of Lots of time, weeks, months, years. In fact, I think the first 25 years of the project, I was so, still searching. <clears throat> the project's 45 years old now. But I've been on every part of the Navajo Nation many times, areas where even a lot of Navajos haven't even been. And we were able to acquire these sheep searching for them and promising the families we would bring them back two sheep if we could buy one. 
that we that fit the criteria, the genetic criteria of that original churro sheep. And we formed our nucleus flock. And again, we had to go through all the procedures and husbandry that Molly showed you in her presentation with wintering, lambing, summer range, stuff like that. Next slide. Pictures of a search. And I'm so grateful for the, these Navajo matriarchs that we were working with over the years. And they, they just love their sheep. You can tell. And the dedication and the importance of this sacred animal. Next slide. And this is the one I just told you about uh, the students. And up here underneath me is Nancy, my wife, who was a big help on the project. She liked to write grants and, and get donations for our nonprofit. But uh, this was where we kept the nucleus flock. So go ahead. And then deployment started in 82. So in five years, we had enough sheep that we could start taking them back. And here I'm delivering sheep to May Jim, who was a very notable weaver at that time near Kinlachi on the reservation in Arizona. And we worked a lot with different weavers and shepherds that heard about us. And uh, so outreach and educational service became a, an effort to teaching people about nutrition of the sheep, health care, making sure that they got the proper vaccinations. A lot of times we would just do the vaccinations and donate the vaccines, but to keep the sheep going and not being butchered. And then in recent years, we developed mentor flocks. And these are people, a lot of them here in Northern Utah that have flocks from the Navajo Sheep Project to help, help us produce more sheep to take down to the reservation for the Navajo folks. Next slide. And Alta, talked about the Hojo Center. And this is an aerial shot of the main Borrego Pass trading post, the barns, the corrals, where will be the headquarters of the, the Hojo Center at Borrego Pass. It's over 2,000 acres that we will acquire. And it's really interesting. I knew the family there before Alta and Carol and the family knew the land was available. Uh, when the family was still alive that ran the trading post, they would let me and my Navajo students camp out there. And so because there's no motels, so we would just camp and they would feed us, you know, give us Vienna sausage and Velveeta cheese and uh, give us always good tours of the trading post of new weavings and the owner of this trading post, he and his wife were really funny. One, one quick thing, he, he was so fond of this weaver, Daisy Toglici, and she has been rated one of the top two Gray Hills style weavers of all times. She's deceased now, and so are the, the family, the Smouse family, but he had one of her rugs and he would never sell it, and his wife was upset because he wouldn't sell it. He says, I'm going to be buried with this rug in my coffin. <laughs> and it was worth at least, you know, at that time, uh, 60 to $70,000, this piece. But uh, I don't know if he got buried with it. Never asked the granddaughter. But anyway, the, the family that owned it has helped us and really acquire the property very well. Hopefully it'll be taken care of soon.
Next slide. And oh, by the way, you'll all be welcome to come down and visit. We'll have classes too down there and sheep and gardens with herbs, all kinds of dyes. Now the project, these, this is the geographic area. Now I'm, we live up at the top here, Logan, where the have our sheep project headquarters is that you see the distance. I traveled mm, lots of times. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I can't I can't add up the years, <laughs> but it's it, it was something I, I need to write a book about, I've been told. And over on the right, you can see Chama, Los Ojos, uh, where Tierra Amaria and Molly and her family and Ganadas de Valle are. And Ra Rama Navajo Reservation down at the bottom here is still Navajos, but it's separated by about 60 some miles from the reservation, main big reservation, but they're still Navajos and they still weave. Okay. And again, these are just some of the families, uh, you know, environments that you work with, with these on Navajo Nation on the left, this is Old Jato, a real neat area near Monument Valley, the Harris family, Harrison family. And this over here is uh, Molly and Antonio's herd uh, back in the days of uh, when they summered up against, up above the Los Brazos, which is above the Chama Valley there, and their, their shepherd. And uh, a wintry day. Next. And then at the church in Los Ojos, I would have been pushing to form a national registry for these sheep in America so we can get Navajo, Hispanic, and Anglos, because a lot of Anglos have these sheep too nowadays, and form a national registry. And uh, that's me sitting between. Uh, Irma Blue House and her husband over here. And uh, just these are the, we all decided to start this national registry there at the Catholic Church. And uh, our registry now has over 6,000 head today. And I would say there's probably close to eight or 9,000 total. Many of them aren't registered yet that we have in the country. Next. And then with the project, we did other things. We tried different yarns, different colors, and sell them to weavers uh, for people that didn't want to spin. We also marketed our pelts of those sheep that we could not keep uh, and were not adequate for breeding purposes. They had some problems maybe. And these pelts marketed mainly at Park City where the Olympics were held. And of course, Ure, Colorado, uh, high tourist areas. And they helped pay for our hay bills and help our students pay them and uh, generate income for the project. Next slide. And then another thing we developed was a complete meal, not just jerky, a meal. This has organic vegetables along with churro meat in it. And churro meat is lean and it's high in the omega-3 fatty acid more than any other red meat. And so we made these, call them stew sticks, in the last seven to eight months without being opened. And they're very, the recipe is of Navajo origin of a good lamb stew. Okay, next. And then on the left picture, uh, by accident, I was the person in the United States that found out that llama, llamas, camelids, alpacas too, but llamas are better, guard animals over flocks. 
to protect them from coyotes and other predators, foxes, and occasionally bears. One of our llamas chased a bear off, I remember. But you can see our llama with the sheep. We use Great Pyrenees dogs, but they got too friendly with people. And even up on the summer range where these are here, uh, and the dog food's costly. And the llamas we found out by grazing studies that they eat weeds, so you don't have to bring in herbicides to spray the weeds. They like thistle. They eat milkweed, they eat poisonous plants. For the poisonous for sheep, but not for them. So we didn't have to use any herbicides. And then on the right, Alta's mother, Mary, I remember telling me many, many, many years before about how the Navajos used to milk their sheep. And I said, nobody's milking them anymore. Let's try milking them. Because most of your best cheeses come from sheep, like feta, pecorino. Uh, oh, that one from France, too. Roquefort. Sheep cheese. So we compared different breeds in this research project and the churro out milked the other American modern breeds. We got lots of good milk, but another product we made that no one ever made, but we, we made what's called ice cream. Delicious. Aggie ice cream, very famous here in Utah. And these sheep were excellent milkers and they're good mothers to take care of their lambs very well, as Molly said. And in all the years, I only had to deliver one set of lambs. Where other sheep breeds, you have to deliver them a lot. They're good. Next. And there we are. And remember this quote, extinction is forever. So we don't want to let these sheep go. Even though a lot of people tried to stop me back in those early years, it was bad. Even a big lawsuit I took against the state of Utah. It broke me. But we won in court by jury with Alta was a te help testify and her husband and many others that we never got our money back because the government claimed government immunity. So they were supposed to pay our legal fees and everything else, but nope. But so be it, we won morally. And Kathy and Kelsey are wonderful people to work with. They've been so patient and I'm grateful to have this opportunity. Even though I was telling Kelsey originally, usually I need about 165 slides to do the job right. <laughs> 21 today. <laughs> I think there's one more. And that's uh, for your contact. She wanted to have contact information. So this is how you can get a hold of this old guy. Uh, we survived the Omicron this year. Knocked us down a little bit, but we're still going. And uh, feel free to email or text us or whatever. Or use the snail mail. And again, I really appreciate it. It's been an honor to be on with Molly and Alta and all you visitors out there with Warp and Kelsey, your patience. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. It's wonderful to hear from you. Um, it's wonderful to hear from all three of you. Um, we are at an hour and a half, but I, I think we could just have a very, you know, just a couple of brief questions. But I also, as I said, we'll be sending a follow up email to everyone who's here with the contact information and the websites for all of our panelists. So I want to start by just thanking you all so much for sharing these experiences and this important story with us today. Um, 
it's really been incredibly informative and inspiring. And um, one question that came in earlier that I'll start with while, um, while folks put other, other questions into the chat um, is what was the justification for the initial slaughter, the slaughter of the, the sheep and the goats? The government considered them overgrazing in the Southwest too much because they were building the Hoover Dam at the time and they thought it would silt up prematurely the Hoover Dam with all the grazing that has taken place. It was, it was not true, but that's the excuse that was used because siltation comes from higher up on the Rio Grande and Colorado rivers, not where the Navajo Nation is, but they use that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll um, just comment on that. Historically, looking at um, indigenous, um, from the indigenous perspective, it, it was a part of an assimilation process that the um, um, all indigenous peoples have been going gone through, you know, so, so this was the Dene one, that this is how they were going to assimilate was to take away the, the the sustainability of our lives, so that we could we had become become um, modernized. So. Extraction. And that extractions also because it, they, we did have a lot of extractions on our on on the Dene Nation also. So it's mm -hmm. all economics um, from from the outside. Thank you for sharing that. And um, one thing I'm not sure if the timeline for the Hojo Center was mentioned today, but we um, we are having this conversation at a really incredible time in the in the um, timeline of this story. I learned um, from Molly, from and Doc and Alta that um, this relationship of working to restore the the churro has been going on for 40 years from. Alta's father's initial um, plan, and now we are just weeks away, or even days away, from the Hojo Center, the land being um, being secured so that the building can begin. So um, it's really an incredible time in this story for us to all be coming together for this conversation. Um, I'm seeing a lot of thank yous coming through in the chat, um, and and a sort of resounding um, resounding sentiment that this is just beautifully brings together uh, the history, your different perspectives, and the work that you've done to, to revitalize the Navajo Churro breed and bring it to the communities. Um, so if, if, is there anything that any of the panelists would like to add uh, before we sign off for the day? I'll just say thank you. Thank you so much for having us on. Ditto. Thank I you. Just, I just want to say thank you also to everybody all for all your support here and allowing us to be in this space. Thank you. And thank you to all three of you. Thank you for sharing this time and your perspectives with us. And um, thank you to all of the work members and guests who have joined us today. And um, in just a few days, we'll be sending the recording and, and the contact information so that you can email the presenters directly. So thank you all, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend.